Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth, um, and I'm from the American Forest Foundation. And today I, I am excited to talk to you about what woodland owners think about bird conservation and wildlife conservation on the whole. Um, and again, we know why this is so important, but just to kind of underline that um, most of the forest land in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic is owned by families and individuals. So it is so important that we um, engage with them to see a lot of the outcomes that we really want on the forest. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about this project that we're doing in Vermont called Woods, Wildlife, and Warblers, um, and then kind of go through um, some findings from our a survey that we did with Southern Vermont landowners about the benefits that they see as what their, why they own their woods, as well as the barriers that they have um, as they think about actively managing their land um, for birds and other wildlife. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how the program helps landowners through their journeys to stewardship and how barriers might shift along that journey as they think more about um, from being unengaged and then engaging with foresters and thinking about doing active management on their land. Um, so, Woods, Wildlife, and Warblers is a nonprofit partnership that works to give Vermont landowners the knowledge, tools, and resources that they need to better care for their woods. And we do this through meeting landowners where they are and providing personalized support. Um, the success of this program is due to a partnership um, and the collaboration and cohesiveness of these partners. Um, American Forest Foundation, Vermont Tree Farm Committee, Vermont Woodlands Association, Audubon Vermont, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, Vermont FPR, Vermont Coverts, NRCS, CVM Extension, and others. We work, we try to work with everybody that we can because everybody has all these amazing strengths that they bring to the table. So why wildlife and warblers? Um, I mean, the woods part is obvious. Um, critical habitat, I'm not even going to try to talk about that. Um, but I do want to talk about the landowner desires. Um, this is what landowners value and care about their land, is the wildlife on it. So um, how do we know that? Um, we surveyed them. Um, and a lot of you might be familiar with the National Woodland Over Owner Survey. And um, uh, we, we kind of took that information um, that people really care about wildlife on their woods. That's one of the main reasons why they own their woods and wanted to dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, so in fall of 2016, we surveyed about 8,000 woodland owners, um, kind of about general ownership, reasons they own their land, barriers to action, um, things like that. And we got 500 responses. Oh, and um, UVA, non-UVA, if there are any non-Vermonters in the audience, it's just the current use program. Um, so, as I said, we wanted to dive a little bit deeper into what people specifically care about when they're thinking about um, why they own their woodlands in relation to the importance of wildlife on their woods. Um, and, you know, consistent with NWOS, people do care about wildlife more than they care about the financial reasons for owning their woods. Um, and specifically, um, people really care about watching wildlife, enhancing habitat, feeding birds and wildlife, and bird watching. Um, less so hunting, tracking, and photographing, but of course, people vary, and a lot of people care about these things too. Um, so, what about management? What do people, what are their, what are, Landowners' attitudes about managing their land for um, bird and wild, other wildlife habitat. Um, so this is good. Um, landowners do not believe that their future plans conflict with managing for habitat, and they are willing to cut some trees to enhance habitat, um, for the most part. So this kind of shows that wildlife can motivate the kind of active management that we need to see to create better uh, forest bird habitat. Um, quick aside here, um, something that's popped for me recently is uh, how landowners tell their stories about their land. Um, 
from what I've experienced, it always includes wildlife, and it always includes specific wildlife that they've seen come through their land that they're really jazzed about. Um, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to say that it's really important that landowners understand how they personally can have an impact on the wildlife that comes through their land. So we can't um, just show them like a picture of woods and think that they're going to understand how that will impact wildlife and how that also impacts you know, contributing to a resilient working woodlands. We have to show them and help them understand like how it helps these specific birds or other animals that they might care about. Uh, so that was an aside, um, but now uh, actions. So we know people care, um, but are they, what are they doing? Um, so again, this is divided up into current use and not current use just because that's how the survey was. But um, I, what I want to focus on is the, the second, the, the, um, the folks that aren't enrolled in the current use program. About a third of them have consulted a forester or other natural resource professional in the last five years. And only about 12% have created a forest management plan with a focus on habitat. Um, but what's really exciting is that our survey found that 44% of that group is considering creating a forest management plan with a focus on bird and wildlife habitat in the next five years. Um, so this is our big area of opportunity. Um, this, these are the people who are really interested, might be really passionate, but um, might not be doing anything yet. So why not? What are the barriers? Um, so we found that, again, I'm just going to kind of talk about this bottom half, um, that the folks that aren't enrolled in current use. Uh, the largest barrier that we see here is knowledge and information. So they're unsure about the activities they should do, and they have concern about doing the wrong thing and harming their land. Um, in addition, um, a lot of people say that it's difficult to find the right professional to find help, or to, to get help. Um, and also, of those considering a forest management plan in the next five years, 77% identified that they had this challenge of finding the right professional to provide help. So um, it's really important. Um, so we know knowledge is a big barrier, um, but we know that books, just giving books, aren't going to help people do things on their land, just like I can't read a book about eating healthy and stop eating cookies, because I love cookies. Um, <laughs> so um, Woods, Wildlife, and Warblers is focused on um, engaging with these unengaged landowners using what is appealing to them. So it's the birds and the wildlife. So these are just to show you some examples, um, some direct mail pieces that we've used in our program, um, in addition to letters. And we've also been venturing into social media advertising to um, engage some new audiences as well. Um, I also just wanted to throw this graph up on the screen to, to show you how important um, trust building is and along those lines, building partnerships because so many people trust so many different types of people. So it's really important that you know you, um, any programs kind of bring folks together that various people might trust. Um, and also the importance of just building those personalized relationships um, with, with landowners. Um, so I just want to throw this graphic up on the screen so that you could see how the American Forest Foundation kind of thinks about a, um, a journey that a landowner might take on their path to stewardship. Um, and this isn't, I'm not trying to say like this is the, the path because we know like people come in and they loop around and it's not linear like this. Um, but in general, um, this is kind of how AFF thinks about the landowner journey to stewardship. Um, and because knowledge is such a barrier, um, starting with connecting to a professional um, or a peer landowner, <clears throat> depending on what that landowner wants, is where we start to build that trust with the unengaged landowner and start to build that knowledge base that will allow them to move along their journey. Um, so <clears throat> part of this program is connecting landowners who um, raise their hands to a professional. Um, they'll 
this is a site visit sheet, the professional will go out to their land, they'll fill out this checklist with the landowner to kind of tell them some actions that they might consider doing, give them a fact sheet, and then give them these fun bird cards to help them um, learn about the birds that they might be seeing on their forest um, and how to identify them. And those are really popular. Um, so, okay, so connecting, to land, connecting landowners to professionals is typically a necessary step for those unengaged landowners. Um, but we don't think in the large majority of cases that that is sufficient, right? Um, we can't just um, connect and then let, let it all go. And um, sometimes it works, but a lot of times it doesn't. Um, so we've seen a lot of stalling out of landowners after they meet with that professional um, or pure landowner. They might not go to the next step of, um, you can't really see that, that's like preparing or planning a management plan um, and then acting, um, actively managing their land. Um, so, of course, part of the reason why we see this stall out is because of forest time and the forest might not be ready for action or the forester might not be ready to write the plan. There's a lot of reasons, but um, another big reason uh, is that it's just the landowner. They just, they, they kind of stop after they get their free visit. Um, they kind of drop off. Um, so why is that? Um, most landowners care. Uh, a lot of them will meet with a professional, but then they don't take that next step of planning to act and then acting. So we resurveyed landowners who had met with professionals and found that after their meeting, their top barrier um, was no longer knowledge. It was really time um, and money. That's what people said. Um, they, they identified as their, their reasons for not doing more. So um, this is important because we know that while we might want to continue engaging landowners, educating them, giving them informational resources they need, that's not what's necessarily going to lead them to that action that um, we hope will help uh, Habitat. Um, so how do we overcome these barriers of time and money? These are hard. Um, so we think that to start to overcome some of these barriers, um, well, first of all, we need to continue to connect and build personal relationships, or we need to have, we need to help landowners continue to connect and build personal relationships with professionals to begin um, their own journey, um, uh, their path to stewardship. Um, we have to help landowners understand opportunities to make management activities more affordable. As we know, they are out there, um, but a lot of landowners maybe don't know about them or kind of have this view that they're not for them or that they take too much time. Um, so we need to help, help them navigate that. Um, we need to help them feel empowered and that they can do something to improve the habitat on their land and get to that, uh, you know, that ultimate uh, vision that they want to see. Um, they have to understand the time requirements for this work so that once they get into it and see, oh gosh, this is going to take me more time than I thought it was, um, they're not, uh, they, they keep going through, through the, that trouble. And then finally we have to um, help them see management for birds and wildlife as a priority um, because we can care about a million different things, um, but only some of the things can be a priority. Um, so how do we do this? We're continuing to connect landowners with professionals. Um, we are trying to better align markets to support recommended management activities. We're, like I talked about, we're helping landowners navigate NRCS reimbursement programs. And we are working to create social norms so that active management is a priority. Um, Okay, so some key takeaways here. There is a huge opportunity. Um, with this program, we've already had over 600 landowners express interest. 50 have met with a professional and um, 20 have gone on to do some sort of habitat actions on their land. Um, we know that we need to always kind of lead with the benefits when we're interacting with landowners, get to understand what they care about their land oftentimes we're going to see that is birds and other wildlife. 
Um, and then we also need to address barriers along the journey, especially as they are changing and shifting as people get to know more. Um, so uh, kind of in closing, we need to uh, establish personal trusting relationships, provide those simple next steps for landowners, and look for opportunities to truly understand and then minimize barriers that landowners have um, for action. So that's it. Um, you probably can't see that because of that, uh, the table, but that's my email over there. If anybody wants the full report of the survey that I was talking about, um, please feel free to email me, e email me and I will send it to you. <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> Do we have time for a couple questions? Anybody ask me? Yes. You can, I'll let you decide. Okay. Uh, the, you in the back, sorry. Sounds like I know you're not helping. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if the graph that you showed about trust mm -hmm. in the different organizations mm -hmm. is really interesting. And I was wondering, did you um, do any follow up of sort of what that is based on? Like, have they actually interacted with all of those organizations mm -hmm. or are they is it sort of based on assumptions they have so completely based on just like who do you trust quickly go through the list and um also on that graph um if there was like a high amount of do not know or like i just don't know this organization then it wasn't reflected or like basically if a lot of people didn't know, it looked like there was a lower trust than there might have actually been because that only showed the people that said trust or highly trust. Yeah. We can do one more quick one. Yes. Um, so you mentioned there's like this free professional visit mm -hmm. and then um, so it looks like that's the second step on that journey. Mm -hmm. So how would that person interact with the Forester, because mm -hmm. I mean, most people in Paris, they have a plan, they have a forester mm -hmm. that they already have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. So, were there barriers there? Like, well, this is what's already my plan, mm -hmm. and I'm already working with my forester. I mean, this other professional's coming in, so I'm assuming it's another forester. Yeah. And how, how did that work out? So, that's a great question. So, we try to reach out primarily to people who aren't in current use. Um, who aren't already working with a forester. And um, so our target was those people, so we could introduce them to this new source of information that they just didn't have before. Of course, we did get people who were enrolled in current use and did have a forester, and we were going to send another forester to them because that, you know, nobody wants that trouble. Um, so uh, we kind of had basically like, if they had, if they met a certain acreage and were in a priority town, we would actually send them. Uh, we would send Steve over, uh, who's an Audubon Vermont uh, uh, biologist, um, to kind of go through and point out um, bird habitat, do a bird habitat assessment, or we would see if they wanted to meet with a pure landowner. So we don't want to, you know, send a forester to somebody who already has one. Thank you very much. Elizabeth. Thanks.